Okay, uh, hi everyone, my, I'm Michał Trojanowski. Uh, I work for Allegro PL. Um, I'm a senior developer there, and um, Allegro is uh, the biggest Polish uh, retail marketplace. We've got around 6 million users, and uh, we serve around 1 million transactions every day. Um, me, myself, uh, I'm part of the API team, and uh, we have two different purposes at the company. So on one side, we help other teams to develop APIs, we um, help them write the documentation, and on the other side, uh, we also maintain our Edge API gateway. At Allegro, we use uh, Auth quite a lot, and um, the original RFC for Auth 2.0 uh, has been with us for quite a few times, and um, it is a um, solid specification, and we're probably all, um, we all knew it quite well. Mm, the original specification um, introduced four different uh, grant types. So that was the client credentials, the authorization code, the implicit grant type, and the password grant type. And uh, but actually, uh, since uh, since the original uh, specification mm, became available, a lot of things have changed around Auth, and the the uh, the whole ecosystem changed. We use uh, different browsers today. The browsers have some uh, better capabilities of uh, enabling cores. Uh, we use different devices. We, we, use TV, we use the internet on TVs and uh, uh, mobile devices, IoT and stuff like that. And there are some new security threats as well. So the original, uh, the original Auth spec started to lack some features. And the community decided to start writing uh, some new specifications that will help extend Auth and add some new features that will uh, that will fit into those, those holes. Uh, so I would like to show you today a few examples of, uh, of those extensions. And um, by these exa examples, I would like to show you that the extensions can touch different parts of Auth and can extend the, the specification in, in very different ways. So the examples I would like to talk today uh, is the device code grant type, which adds a whole new authorization flow to, to Auth the token exchange, which uh, adds some more features for, uh, for a specific use case, and the proof key for code exchange, which uh, on the other side adds some more security to the authorization, authorization code flow. So let's start with the device code green type, and to do that, um, let's move back to uh, one step to the authorization flow and have a quick look at uh, how the original authorization code grant type uh, looked like. So uh, I'm, I hope you're familiar with the flow, but um, so we have the client uh, here on the left, uh, bottom left, and the client, when initializes the, um, the authorization flow, it does that through the user agent, the browser, and then the, um, the user um, passes the, um, the authentication authorization, and the authorization server sends back the authorization code through a redirect URI back to the browser and back to the client, and the client can then exchange the authorization code for an access token. So in this flow, there are two very important points. So the client needs to have an access to a user agent, and the client needs to be able to uh, receive back the redirect response uh, to be able to get the, the authorization code in order to exchange it for an access token. So what if uh, we have devices or situations where we don't have access to, to a browser? For example, we want to have um, uh, the auth enabled on the IoT device, or we have uh, access to a browser, but we have some limited input capabilities, like on a TV when you try to you know, enter your 32-character password from a, from a remote control, that can be a bit tricky. So to help with that situation, the device code grant type adds a new authorization flow to, uh, to auth. And uh, this is a specification which is still in a draft status. It hasn't been accepted as RFC yet, but I'm pretty sure most of us have, uh, have seen it uh, and used it. Uh, so this is the situation where we separate the two, uh, the two devices, the one device which asks for the authorization and the other device uh, on which we grant the authorization. So if you ever had a situation where you have, like, you know, your YouTube app on the TV and uh, you want to log into your, your account and you do it from your mobile phone, that is some sort of implementation of the device code, uh, device code grant type. So um, 
how does it look like? Uh, here we have the client, which is, for example, a TV app. And the client uh, initiates, uh, initiates the authorization flow um, by sending a request to the authorization server. And it gets back uh, three pieces of, ins of information, which is the user code, a device code, and a verification URI. It then presents the verification URI and the user code to the user, and the user has to go to another device, um, browse to the verification URI, and enter the user code. And at the same time, the client starts polling the authorization server with the device code and asks if the user has authorized the app yet. When the user authorizes the, the application, the client gets back the access token from the authorization server. So in a bit more detail, uh, first we have uh, a request from the client to the authorization server. It's a post request where the client um, receives the device code, which is a long and secure string that shouldn't be easy to, to brute force. The user code, which on the other hand should be short and fairly easy, because this is the code that the user will have to type on another device. So you don't want to be too complicated for the user to be typing in somewhere else. And the ver verification URI, which is the web page where the user has to, um, has to verify the, the original device. The client then has to um, present it to the user, or if it doesn't have any means of presenting information, it can send it through an SMS, through uh, email, or anyhow uh, get those information to the user, the verification URI, and the user code that the user has to, has to enter on another device. And at the same time, it starts polling the authorization server. The client starts polling the authorization server. It sends post request to the token endpoint. Uh, and it uses the, this new grant type. This has a, quite a long and complicated name. But the auth RFC says that new grant types should have fully qualified unique names. So that's why we use this, uh, um, this, long, this long name here, with ends with uh, device underscore code. And uh, at first, it will probably get, a, get an error, a 400 error, which says authorization pending, uh, which means that the user hasn't authorized the, the app yet. And so we, st we need to keep asking the authorization server if the user has already authorized the app. Hopefully, the user will authorize the access. That was the only joke here on the presentation, so I'm sorry I didn't <laughs> like it. Uh, <laughs> and. Um, and when the client, um, uh, when the when the user authorizes the app, the client with the next request for the token will just get the usual auth uh, auth token back in the in the response. So that's uh, that's how it works. Um, the token exchange. Mm, that's a uh, that's a feature. That's another feature which is still in a draft status, but is one that um, helps you. Um, mm, in situations where you, as one user, you want to do some other action uh, on behalf of another user. So you can think of situations where you have an admin account and you want to do something on behalf of some, some uh, regular user, or where you have some um, like a super account or uh, main account and it has some sub-accounts of uh, different, uh, different users, and you want the sub-accounts to be able to do something on behalf of the main account. And to do that, the, uh, the um, extension proposed to, to use a new grant type. And again, we have this long, fully qualified name, which ends with um, token dash exchange. And I don't know if you, um, if you noticed a, a bit of a difference here with the device code. We had an underscore in the device code, and here we use a hyphen. So that's, you can see the different people writing different RFCs, unfortunately, use different conventions for the names. but. Um, so we use this grant type to, to make a post request to, to an endpoint, and we add two parameters, which is a subject token and a subject token type. The subject token is the token of the original user, and the type is the type of this token. The extension um, gives you a list of types of the tokens that you can use with this extension. And uh, you can actually do it in, t in two ways, uh, the token exchange. So you can either want to impersonate another user. So the, uh, 
the resource uh, server will not know that you're ac actually another party. So then you do it with such a request. And you can also uh, delegate to another user. So in the token, you will have explicit information that you're doing something on behalf of another user. And then you have to add two more um, parameters here, which is an actor token and actor token type. So these are the tokens of the user who want to do the, the exchange action. And you get back another token, which can be used to access the, the resources. The token exchange uh, extension also proposes to add four different, uh, four new claims to uh, JITs, to JSON web tokens, uh, or JOTs, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Uh, anyway, um, it says you don't have to, of course, use uh, JSON web tokens with your auth, but if you do, you can add those claims, which will help. Um, identify the, uh, the actors that are uh, exchanging the tokens. If you don't use JSON Web Tokens, you can uh, probably mimic this, uh, this functionality and, and add it to any technology that you're, that you're using. So the first is the act claim, it's actor claim, and uh, it uh, contains any other claims which help us identify the party which initiated the token exchange. So it can have claims like sub, subject, issuer, um, ISS and, and uh, stuff like that inside, and it can be nested if the token exchange, if there have been several parties which exchange the tokens in a, in a chain. Then the scope claim, which is a list of scopes, is pretty much the same scopes as, uh, as we use in auth, but um, because we are uh, dealing here with uh, one user making actions as another user, the, uh, the authors of the specification says that you, you should probably limit the uh, amount of, uh, of actions that the other user can do for security reasons. So you should use scopes and probably limit the scopes of what can be done on behalf of the, of the original user. Also, the client ID claim, which is just the ID of the client, which initiated the token exchange request, and a may act claim, which uh, is pretty much the same as the act claim, but it's, uh, it says which users or which subjects can initiate a token exchange. So in this example, we have, uh, we have a token of the subject user at example.com, and it says in the claims that the admin at example.com can initiate a token exchange for, for this user. Okay. So, the, the third one, the proof key for code exchange, is, um, is the one dealing with security, and it adds some more security features to, to auth. And uh, it's, um, it solves a problem for situations where you have, um, where you have clients uh, which have all of their code base available to, to the users. So uh, situations where you have single page applications, you have, um, mobile, you have applications on mobile devices, or um, desktop apps which are installed on, on user devices. So situations where you have the, the whole code base is, is available on the, on the user system. And in the original auth, we used to use the implicit grant type for those situations, but implicit grant type is, uh, is not secure and it's been deprecated. And it's, uh, now they say that you should use the, the authorization flow, but still the authorization flow has some, some security issues and uh, can, be ex um, can be exploited in some ways. So here's an example of an authorization code hijack. It's, a, uh, it's an attack that has been uh, actually observed in the wild. It's pretty, pretty complicated and pretty difficult to, uh, to do it, actually. But, um, but the idea is that you have uh, you can imagine you can have uh, two different applications on a mobile device. So we have the legitimate, legitimate green auth application and a malicious app, the red one. And the legitimate application starts the authorization flow. It sends a request through the uh, system browser. The request is sent to the authorization server. Authorization server responds with an author authorization code. And then the malicious app hijacks the authorization code and exchanges it with the authorization server for an access token, and it gets the user's access token, and it can then access all the user's resources. So to mitigate this, 
the uh, idea of proof key for code exchange is to add some more information to those two requests. The first one that initiates the authorization flow and the, the token request which exchanges the authorization code for, for an access token. The extension proposes to add to the first request to add a transformed code verifier. So it's a code verifier that, that has been uh, transformed via a, a certain method. And you send with the request the method that you used and a transformed code verifier. The authorization server stores this information. And within the, with the second request where you exchange the code for the token, you send the original code, verif code verifier. And then the authorization server can take this code verifier, use the method to transform it again, and check if the first string and the second string are equal. And only then uh, it will issue an access token to the client. So thanks to that, the authorization server is sure that the client which uh, got the authorization code and the client which exchanges the authorization code is actually the same client. So it's sure that nobody hijacked the, the authorization code. So this is something you should use um, in those um, situations where you have a, like single page applications or mobile apps. So the code verifier um, is said to be a random string between 43 and 128 characters. That's, that's the proposed uh, in, uh, in the standard. So it's secure enough. And the transformation, so they call it a code challenge. So it's the transformed code verifier. Should be the, the code verifier are either transformed with SHA-256, or if your uh, device, for any reasons, can do SHA-256 transformations, just uh, send it as plain, as plain text, so don't transform it. So you can, you can have two options for a method here, so either SHA-256 or, or, or plain method. And you send that to the authorization server, and with, uh, with the token request, you should include the original code verifier, and then the authorization server can transform it again using SHA and check if the code challenge equals the transformed code verifier, and only then issue the, um, the authorization token, the uh, access token. So that's, that's the idea behind this extension. So uh, you can uh, find more information in the, in the RFCs and the drafts. And uh, if, you've, if you're interested in those, uh, in those features, it's, it's always nice to, to have a look at the RFCs, because they contain more information. They contain some, some security um, considerations that you should uh, t t take into um, that you should take if you want to implement those uh, mm, those extensions. So that's that's always good to to have a look at the other um, specifications if you want to work with that. And that's everything for me. Thank you for listening.